worship with us. I hope everyone is able to stay cool and refreshed on this blessed summer and that everyone is doing well. We continue our service now with our brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. The grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the reconciling love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's sing now together our Kyrie. Let's start that one more time. <laughs> we had a technical error there for a second. Have mercy on us, Lord, and hear our solemn prayer. We come to hear your living word. It saves us from despair. Have mercy on us, Christ, and wash away. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another.
So thank you all. It's a joy to pass peace with you uh, and to share it. Um, so my wife told me the other day that I say all right too much. Just the word right? Sometimes right or all right variations, right? Okay, so um, I'm not preaching today, so I won't say it as much. Uh, uh, Reverend Rod Harwood is going to preach for us. I'll introduce him a little more formally later, but we're glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Um, and so next week, not this week, if I say it right too much, I want, I want people to, I don't know, what, to raise their hand? All right. Because clearly it's become a bad habit, and I think my wife will enjoy it a great deal. So, Just my, okay, Katie will do it. We'll give her a flag. How's that? Uh, um, we, do, we do have a few actual announcements this morning, don't worry. Uh, the first, of course, is Vacation Bible School coming up. It begins uh, August 7th. I hope that you have signed up. Uh, we have registration forms out on the table right out there in the narthex. They are a fun kind of salmon-y orange color, uh, hard to miss. So fill those out and turn them back in, and we'll make sure we get you there. Just as a reminder, if you are trying to encourage people to come, uh, lunches will be provided, and it is free. So we hope that uh, that encourages as many people to participate as possible. Also, uh, the Luther Haven kids, these are the counselors for the summer camp, are coming to lead up the, the uh, Vacation Bible School, and we're going to welcome them with a barbecue on the 6th. That's the Sunday before, so a week from today at 5 p.m. We hope that you can come, bring a side, bring a dessert. Uh, there'll be uh, hamburgers and hot dogs provided, of course, so please join us there. I um, also want to draw to everyone's attention the flowers today unfortunately we didn't get into the bulletin but they are in memory of Jens and Kari Jensen who uh, who uh, in, in the memory of their passing so we want to celebrate them but also Tori Estrada for her birthday right so we, we want to celebrate that as well let's see any other announcements from the congregation for the good of the people oh we know I, I'll get to it Norman thank you we caught that um, you may notice that we've got some lovely people up here, but it's not all of our regular crew, and there's a couple of errors. We're working on that, but stay with us, and I'll let you know when we get to them. All right? Oh, that wasn't right. I'm okay. That was all right. <laughs> Wait, no, that still counts. Uh, but let's please continue now with our prayer of the day. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson for today is Psalm 42. We will be reading this responsively. I'll read the light print if you'd please respond with the dark. I need a sip of water. Yes, clearly I'm skipping the children's sermon, so let's not do that. If I could please have the children come forward. <laughs> I'm doing my best this morning, people. Work with me. <laughs> Four? All right. Good morning. How are you all doing? You're doing well? Everybody feeling good? Feeling happy? Have you ever been sad? You've definitely been sad before? Nick, have you ever been sad? I think you've been sad. I think you're making me sad. What about you, Amy? Have you ever been sad? A little bit. It happens from time to time. So why do you think, why do we get sad? What happens when we get sad? Do you know why you've been sad? Something didn't go the way you were hoping? Maybe something bad happened, right? Maybe uh, you're just having a bad day. Is that possible? So what do we do when we feel really sad? What are, what are things, you know, we do? Have you? What's that? Take deep breaths. That's good advice. I like that. Try and calm down a little bit. But do you, have you ever cried when you've been sad? You pet a cat? That's a good thing, too. I've cried when I get sad, too. You know, it's okay to be sad sometimes. You know that, right? Sometimes that's the appropriate feeling. Something we were hoping would happen doesn't happen, or something unexpected that is sad happens, right? Maybe you lose a loved one or a pet or, or just something disappointing happens, right? And you feel sad. Why do we feel sad? Why, do you guys know why we feel sad? 
Like, why do our bodies respond like that? Well, one theory I've heard is because we cry when we're sad, because that's a way for other people to recognize that we're feeling sad so that they can come and comfort and help us. Have you ever heard that idea? Is that what happens in your families? If you're sad, do people come and comfort you? Give you a hug? Oh, give me a break. Don't shake your head no at me. No, we we no, nobody ever gives you a hug? Have you ever asked for one? Not much? Do you like hugs? <laughs> I'm starting to understand. But one of the things we are called to do as God's people is to comfort and console one another, right? Because sadness happens, and that's okay. It's a, it's, a, it's a response to something that bad happens, right? Especially if we lose a loved one, we, we feel sad, and that's appropriate. But it's okay to be sad and to say, hey, I'm feeling sad today. Can you please offer me some comfort? So if you're feeling sad, if you're crying, it's okay to let people know. Then they can be there and support you in the midst of your sadness, just as God always does. God is always there with us in the midst of our sadness. Even though we might feel lonely, God is there, and that's important to remember. Can you do that? Yeah? Even in the midst of sadness, even when the tears are falling, God is there holding you up, embracing you, right? Or you're giving me a funny look. I'm, I'm talking spiritually now, right? Can you remember that? Let's say a prayer. Lord God, we ask for your blessing today, your blessing and your support for when we're sad. Be with us, comfort us, strengthen us, and bring us people that will be there for us when we need them family and friends, loved ones, pastors and church members, all those people that can help us and want to help us. Help us to remember that we are not alone and we don't have to be sad alone. You have sent us good people to help care for us. And we're grateful for that. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming up. I appreciate it. First reading, Psalm 42. As I said, I'll read the light if you'd respond with the dark. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember, as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my hope and my God. My soul is cast down within me, Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizzard. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully? Because the enemy oppresses me. As with the deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. This is what Norman was talking about. The, unfortunately, the wrong lesson is printed there. I will read the correct lesson. If you would like to follow along, you'll find it, of course, in your Bibles in the pews in front of you. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Or press down... Oh, excuse me. I'm reading the wrong one. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I must not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Hear, and I will speak. 
I will question you and you declare to me, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite you now to please rise for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another, all will be thrown down. When, his sit when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign of your coming? and the end of the age. Jesus answered them, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the birth pain. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So now I would like to re invite Reverend Rod Harwood forward to preach for us today. He uh, sometimes refers to himself as the Minister of the In-Betweens. Um, he's got a fancy title, and he told me what it is, but I can't remember. The Obi Gobi, was that right? <laughs> first introduced this job to me because for 30 years I spent as a chaplain, uh, 19 of those here at St. Anthony's. Um, when that job disappeared, poof, it was gone. Uh, Gobi, Greater Oregon Behavioral Health, came to me and they said, we think we have a job for you. And I said, what is that? It's our OB Gobi position. Uh, do I get a lightsaber with that? And what it is, it's part of a statewide initiative, older adult behavioral health initiative. Recognize we've got a lot of older adults and many more on the way. 10,000 hitting 65 every day in this country. And so the state's created this position, 24 of us across the state. For the past seven years, I've covered eight counties, but now I'm down to just five. Uh, and as an older adult behavioral health coordinator, my job is to uh, build collaboration amongst community partners that are serving older adults, provide education to the workforce and to community members, and to do complex case consultations. So that's what I've been doing the last seven years. And part of the reason how I ended up here today, be careful when you ask to, to come and speak at the church, I actually asked uh, Pastor if I could come and just share for a few moments about a class that I was offering to older adults. If you're experiencing uh, the blues or sometime, well, as Pastor was sharing at the children's mess, we get sad sometimes. So what do we do about that? And there's a class I'll be offering that... Uh, it's called PEARLS, which is a program to enhance active, rewarding lives. And it's a six-week class for older adults because, you know, as older adults, we experience loss. We have health changes. Uh, some of you that may be joining uh, through the Internet, uh, maybe because of health problems, you can't be here. Uh, you may be feeling social isolation, things like that, which all can lead to feelings of sadness at times. 
So all of us, I know, sometime during this coming year, I will probably experience some sadness, some depression, some blues. Well, this class that's going to be offered is going to pr provide some tools, some skills to uh, help address that. So when we are sad, what do we do about it? So I had come to the pastor and say, hey, could I come and just share a few words? I did that last week at First Presbyterian Church during announcements. And pastor, why don't you just give the message? <laughs> so here I am. Um, with that, in line with what I just talked about, I am reminded of back when I first started my chaplaincy experience. I was doing my first uh, practice, if you will, uh, clinical practice. I was at Erlanger Medical Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was going to seminary just up the road in Chattanooga. And so I was assigned to make visits on this one floor at Erlanger Medical Center. And of course, I am just this young seminarian. I don't know what I am doing. In fact, that's why I was doing what's called clinical pastoral education, because I wanted to learn how to be a pastor. And so I was assigned to go uh, from room to room. And I remember I had my my Bible with me. <laughs> okay, if I don't know what anything else, I can read a scripture, you know. And I came to this one room, and there was this elderly African-American lady that was in there who was rather stoic, and she had already lost a part of one limb be due, a, due to diabetes. And I was, I come in and I'd say hello and I would try to engage her and she just really didn't say that much. And back then, when, when you were a patient in the hospital, lots of times you were there for a while, uh, not just in and out. And so when I came back again, she was there, same sort of en engagement, not much interaction. I could sense that she was down. Uh, and I thought, how in the world am I going to engage this lady? I already felt like I was in a foreign land, being down south. In fact, they would laugh at me, at my strong northern accent. Uh, but I thought, how do I relate to this, this lady? And I looked in the chart, and I noticed that she had been an active member in a church that she had been part of. And one day during my devotions, I read Psalm 42. And as, I don't know if you know this, but Psalm 42, it was written uh, by a worship leader who had been taken into exile in Babylon. And saw the temple where he had taken would lead the congregation to worship at the temple, as the psalm refers to. And that joyous, celebratory experience of coming to the temple of God, the house of God, and feeling the presence of God there, now the temple had been destroyed. And knowing full well that he may never go back. And that experience of that hunger for connecting to God. As a deer pants for water, as I walk along the river out here and it gets smaller and smaller as the summer goes by. And that you're looking for that living water, flowing water. Is it going to still come? Well, the writer of this psalm was looking for that living water, and it had been cut off. And thinking that somehow I just want to get back there, 
That's where I connect to God. And I can't, and I'm, why is my soul so downcast within me? Where are you, God? How can I experience God again? And it's interesting, at the very beginning of this psalm, this is so important, at the very beginning of this psalm, it, it, there's this word right at the top. It says, a maskil, and I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, but it, it's a musical term, and it's instruction to the song leader. This psalm, and you'll find it in front of several other psalms, this psalm is meant to be, there's a lesson here. There is something to learn that you can learn from this psalm. So that's what this psalm's all about. And the first thing, and I, I'm getting back to that story of the African-American lady, I felt impressed, call it the leading of the Spirit, to read that psalm to her. And so when I came back in and saw her again, I asked her, is it okay if I read this psalm to you? And she nodded her head. And I began reading the psalm. And as I read that psalm out loud to her, first tears began to flow. Then weeping occurred. And after the end of the psalm, she talked about, she says, I used to be choir leader in my church. You know, if you've ever been in an African-American church, that, that engagement of singing and celebratory experience, if you ever watch that movie, you know, uh, Preacher's Bride, that's that type of thing. That's what she was. Now, going before to the house of God and experience. For her, it seemed like a distant memory. And even as the writer said, I think about Mount Mizmor, about from the plains of Jordan, which is to the south, very southern part of Israel, to the Hebron mountains, Mount Mizmor, the very northern border. I, I remember, I long for that experience. And now I'm hearing from the prophet Jeremiah in a letter that God says we're not to go back. I, you know, we're, we're planning. We're going to go back. We're going to overthrow. We're going to get back. And I'm hearing from Jeremiah, God says, no, you're to stay there. Israel, you are to stay there for 70 years. What does that mean for me? I'm not going to see home again. That's what the writer here, this is what he is experiencing here. So for me, the first lesson, if you will, of this psalm is that God wants us to share our grief, to share our sorrow, not to keep it in. And that's one of the things, sometimes the stigma of depression or sadness we think we're just supposed to be stoic, or it's just supposed to keep it. Somehow that's weakness. But this psalm, because it is written and documented here, says, no, you are to share it. You are to tell God and the congregation exactly how you feel. This is what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to keep it in. If you keep it in, you can never move on. You can never experience healing. You can never experience recovery. And that's the first lesson. The next lesson is, here again, the temple was destroyed. And in the gospel reading, we have Jesus engaging his disciples and letting them know this second temple and all these beautiful stones that Herod had put up as outer buildings, not one 
stone will be left upon another. Now, can you imagine the, how it reverberated within them, just shook them, these disciples? Because not only did they have the, uh, the memory of their people of the first temple being destroyed, but now this temple, even with all these massive stones of the, the outer buildings, not one stone was going to be left upon another. This has got to be the end. This has got to be the end. But Jesus says, no, this is not the end. It's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. And it's the, the birth pain, pain, uh, pains of what is to come. So if you have people coming to you, and I'm sure just like the writer of the Psalms back in Babylon, you would have those people coming to the, those messiahs saying, well, let's rise up, let's revolt, we can conquer. Jesus says, you're going to have other messiahs that are going to come. Don't listen to them. This is not it. When, when you have... These things in life, whether it's a death of loved one or death the way things were. I know seven years ago when I was announced my job, I thought I was going to retire from that job. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been doing a good job. Poof. It's gone. Is this the end? And when we think it's the end, we give we lose hope. We don't see a tomorrow. But Jesus says, this is not the end. And as the writer of Psalm, he was grasping there with hope. He says, put your hope in God. I don't see God. Uh, the only way I see God is in there at the temple. This is how I've always experienced God. But my faith tells me to put my hope in God. Even as I wrestle, you see that tension going on there. That struggle. I, I struggle. I am, I, my tears are my food. Even the enemies around say, where is your God? Where is your God? You, you mighty Israelite, where is your God? Or even the demons within, if you will, those voices within said, God doesn't love you. God has no future for you. The future that you thought God had, it's gone. It's gone. But that lesson there is, this is not the end. So where is your God? Where is your God? If it's not in the temple, if it's not experiencing God by leading the worship, uh, the people to, to the temple, where do you find God? And God himself is our very source of life, our very source of hope, our very source of peace, our source of meaning. Where is your God? And that's where we go to the Job reading. And I love this. You know, the whole book of Job, basically, first off, is less, a lesson of here's this man who is an example of a life that's lived righteously, honoring God, and yet everything, everything that he had been stripped away from him, including his health, his family, his wealth, and even his reputation was being questioned by his friends. And after them all giving the reasons why possibly he'd been suffering by his friends saying this, and then Job just kind of struggling here, then God steps in 
And for four chapters leading up to this passage right here in, in Job 42, God then lays out for four chapters about his, his plan is being worked out through the universe. If you want to see how God works, read those four chapters. And then, then Job says, you know, <laughs> you know I, I, I really had no idea what your plan is. I thought I knew. I thought I knew. And, and what I've come to realize, that up till now, what I knew of you, God, I only read about, I only heard about. But it's in the midst of me losing everything. All of this stripped away. Think about that writer, the Psalms, even the temple and everything being stripped away. Only after all that was stripped away, he says that I have actually come really to see you for who you are. So where is your God when you're in the midst of feeling like, why should I go on? God is there in that darkness. You can read what Psalms 139, where can I go from your presence? If I'm in the heavens, you know, going to the temple, or if I'm in the depths of hell, even there you are there. So even when we are losing everything, we can then know that God is there. And finally, if you will, the rest of the story. So we have again this worship leader who can no longer lead the procession to the temple. That's never going to happen. It's not. He's never going to see his homeland again, and that, which was almost the representation of God's faithfulness to the people. You know what the rest of the story is? We've heard about synagogues. Really, you all sitting here is as a result of, in the Jewish tradition, synagogues, local groups, coming together in congregations, whether at one site in a community or in a home, coming to worship God and reading of the word. Up till that point, uh, even the, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets, the, generally the people themselves did not have that in their presence to read. That was something that was done at the temple. But because they were taken away from all that, they actually then began to produce copies of the Torah to be read in the synagogues. Variations of the synagogues had existed before, but it began to be a... a, a regular part of the of the faith and so you'd have these rabbis who would teach and they would read the Torah or another passage of scripture you see this writer had defined the problem of needing to connect with God tying in with the fact that you had in order for that to happen you had to overthrow Babylon, you had to go back to Jerusalem and you had to build the temple. Made that problem that big. But actually the true problem was just connecting with God. How do I do that? What is it that I need to do? And even in the Psalms it says, as deep calls the deep, it's the thundering waterfalls. That, that's even a lesson there saying... Pay attention. What is it that you can do that recognizes that your, your soul can connect with God's spirit? Whatever activity that is, that's what you need to do. 
And so they created, problem solved, creating synagogues. They pivoted. They learned. They adjusted. And so it is, as we get older, we experience, again, lots of disappointments, lots of heartaches, lots of losses. We find ourselves in that in-between space between what we had and what may be. And there God is, working with us as we respond to him to create something new. And putting in one last push for the pearls. If you're interested in that, you can meet me afterwards. And uh, love to have you join us this coming week, starting on Tuesday, actually. Because it's going to be at First Presbyterian Church. So, thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely message. So uh, I'll reiterate as well, the, the Pearls class, for any that are interested, it'll be at the First Presbyterian Church here in Pendleton this coming Tuesday. What time does that start? 10 a.m. to 11.30. Six weeks, 10 a.m. to 11.30. So. Perfect. All right, yeah, so talk to uh, Reverend Harwood after the service and, uh, and check him out. And uh, if you're watching at home, um, is there a website they can go to? We'll get it on. That's a great idea, yeah. We'll get you that information. Just call the office here, and we'll make sure you know where you need to go. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so he'll be here after the service to talk. We will be having our class a little later after the service to talk about uh, Methodist theology. If you're able to stick around, please join us for that. But uh, be sure to catch up with uh, Reverend Harwood. I'd like to invite you now to please rise for our hymn of the day. Uh, I'd actually like to invite you to grab your red hymnals. Uh, we noticed there was a little printing error in this one. Uh, it's, it is hymn 631. But let's all sing together. Love divine, all loves excelling.
please be seated for our prayers of intercession. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. Almighty God, we pray for the church and all servants of the gospel. Equip rostered and lay ministers to proclaim that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Form confirmands and catechumens into disciples. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, we pray for the well-being of creation. Safeguard the environment, clean polluted rivers and lakes, preserve the mighty trees and the tiny mustard seed, and send advocates for sustainable practices. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, we pray for the nations. Instill in all who govern the ability to discern between good and evil. Free those who are oppressed and protect those facing danger. Promote peace across the world and in our towns and neighborhoods. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, we pray for all in any need. Protect those fleeing from war. Shelter any who are in poverty. Clothe the naked. Soothe, soothe all who grieve and heal the sick. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, we pray for this congregation, both those gathered today and those absent from our assembly. Grant safety to travelers and refreshment and safety for children attending summer camps or community programs. Give direction to any experiencing life transitions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For whom else do the people of God pray? Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for your saints who now rest from their labors. Inspire us by their witness to treasure the gospel and continually nourish us with your grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all of creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our service continues now with our offering. all good things, 
Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed with your love, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. If you'd please rise now as you're able for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Again, at the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Here at Peace Lutheran Church, all people are welcome at the Lord's table, so I will invite you to come forward and share in this blessed meal as soon as it is prepared. Thank you.
sweet and early Jesus is calling, calling all sinners come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. If you'd please rise now for the blessing and the dismissal. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Let's sing our sending song together on our way rejoicing. Thanks be to God.